Tonight, we're in Leviticus chapter 10. And Leviticus is about to throw a wrench in the system. Sometimes, uh, I love these, uh, these cartoons you can find, you know, Far Side or, or, uh, or Garfield or whatever the cartoons are that you like. Peanuts. Some of them like to uh, talk about the way kids think. And I, it was one of these that was talking about uh, a platypus and said, uh, why in the world did God make a platypus? And one of the other kids says, I think just to have a lot of fun and mess around with people. In other words, it doesn't seem to fit in anybody's classification. Leviticus chapter 10 may be one of those kinds of chapters. We think we can get God figured out. We can put him into a box. We can figure out the system that if we figure out the system right, everything will fall into line. We'll get what we want because we can work the system. But God is not a system. God is a person. And so every once in a while, there will be some chapter or some story that is meant to make you step back and say, wait a second, there's far more going on than at first I realized there's something richer, deeper, more complex. And those are the moments when we step back and we say something like, the Lord is in his holy temple, let all the earth keep silence before him. That's the line that we have in some of these songs. Maybe you remember the song that many of us grew up in churches where the first song you'd hear was, uh, the Lord is in his holy temple. It meant everybody be quiet, we're about to start church. That's actually from one of the minor prophets where this person is very upset and he says to God, God, you've got a problem on your hands. Your people are not obeying you and other people are watching it and they're thinking bad things about you because of the way your people act. And so God says, no problem. I'll bring a foreign nation to come and destroy them and that'll teach them a lesson. And then the prophet says, well, now you got two problems on your hands. God then explains himself and the prophet says, okay. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Leviticus 10 breaks up the monotony about how to do sacrifices, how to do worship, how to make your offering, how to work the system. And it throws a wrench in the story. You know, when you read um, some of these historians who try to describe ancient people, in ways that make sense to modern life, you can fall into the habit of an anachronism. That's where you say, oh, you know, the, the Pharisees were the Republicans and the Sadducees were the Democrats or something like that. And you say, well, maybe in some ways, but not in, not in all ways. I actually was re reading one time years ago that said the uh, Pharisees were the conservative party. Think about how they care about rules. And the Sadducees were the liberal party. Remember how they didn't respect the first five books of Moses? There you go. Well, just a few weeks ago, I was reading someone who said, no, it's the exact opposite. The Pharisees were the liberal party. Think about how they added all these extra rules. And the Sadducees were the conservative party. By not accepting the first five books of Moses, they had a smaller canon, less books, less rules. Do you see what I'm getting at? You try to find some phrase to make the ancients fit into our boxes for the moderns, and you're going to miss it somewhere. So I want to talk a little bit about the left and the right, but I don't know what phrases to use. Uh, we'll say the far left. Think of far left as lawlessness. Anything goes. Flowery icing with no substance. The phrase I heard was, minds so open that if they turned their heads, their brains would fall out. Far right. Those are people who can admit of no gray. Everything is black and white. Everything is literal, which means there's no beauty. So much meat, 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 you choke on the meat. What's attractive in these far positions that cause people to go to extremes? Well, the answer is something good and something bad. The far left, for example, in theological circles has a good focus on the love of God, on generosity, on humility before the face of the Almighty. You might think of the phrase that often used in the far left theologically, which is, who do you think you are when you start telling everyone that you know what God's going to do? 
or how God thinks or who God is. But if there's a bad focus on the far left, it would be maybe a tendency to let the heart rule the head. There's often a lack of a clear theology of discipleship. After all, if God is so full of love that you end up seeing him as a Santa Claus only, only wanting to give to you and never confronting you, it's very, very hard to ever come down on a sense of duty and obedience. The far right has a very good focus on God's holiness, on obedience, on responsibility. You might think of a phrase like this, how dare you presume upon God? If there's a bad focus, it might be a lack of a clear theology of sin. As I understand sin in the Bible, it has affected every area of my life. So the idea that somehow maybe I mess up and do bad things occasionally, but I can figure out the mind of God. There may be a problem not realizing that that too has been affected. And so God offers texts like Leviticus 10 to challenge our tendencies. Everybody in this room is perfectly balanced. You know you are, right? Because the left is always to our left and the right is always to our right. We are the perfect middle but we all lean some direction, don't we? And if our tendency is to run to one pole or the other pole, let Leviticus 10 challenge us. The first seven verses of Leviticus 10 is a story of an execution. God has appointed Aaron and his sons to officiate. There's been a long ceremony, a special ceremony to set them out. And just seven verses in, Nadab and Abihu are destroyed. And then, beginning in verse 8, one of the very, very rare times in the whole Bible, God speaks directly to Aaron and says something like, I haven't given up on you. And then starting in verse 16, the rest of the day involves more rituals and they get that wrong too. And Moses is livid. Aaron says, give me a break. And Moses says, okay. Get ready for a wacky chapter. To try to explain what's going on here, I went to the commentaries, which you know my favorite definition, too much time on their hands. And the commentaries say this is a very difficult chapter. It's a chapter that offers more questions than answers. Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire, and it doesn't tell you what that means. Some say it means it was at the wrong time, or at the wrong place, or they wore the wrong clothes, or they showed up ill-prepared. Jacob Milgram in his commentary says, because a little bit later, God says, no strong drink for priests. Maybe it's because they showed up drunk as a skunk. But the text doesn't actually say. Why do the other two sons of Aaron not fulfill the rest of the rituals the way they're supposed to? After all, their brothers were just slaughtered for getting it wrong. How come they also get it wrong? Why does Aaron seem to think that, that he can get a pass for it? And why does Moses say, yeah, you're probably right about that? More questions than answers. I want to be fair to Scripture. Best I can do is tell you that I'm going to do my best at figuring out a way to read this chapter. But I want to show you where I get this way from in two other stories in the Old Testament. Let's build up to it. I want to start... In 2 Chronicles chapter 30. 2 Chronicles 30, Hezekiah has enacted reform. And the people are excited. And let me tell you about what an amazing wheeler dealer this guy is. He sends out word and says to all the scattered tribes, let's get back together and celebrate the feasts and the Passover as we're supposed to. And remember now, we're talking Hatfields and McCoys. This is North and South Civil War style. And yet, there were some 
of Ephraim and Manasseh and Issachar and Zebulun who RSVP and say, I'm going to come and I'm going to celebrate with you. Pretty amazing. There were rules. They hadn't been keeping the rules, and so they're, revi- they're learning. They're, they're revising their memory of it. The first thing Hezekiah realizes is it's the wrong month. Well, actually, what he realizes is they're not quite ready, and the law allows you to wait one month to get them ready, so he does that. But now he's got another problem on his hands. These northern tribe members who come, they are a month late anyway, and they're not ready to do the Passover right either. And in 2 Chronicles 30, the text says that they partook of the feast without being ceremonially cleansed, quote, against the instructions of the Lord. Now, depending on the way you were raised, depending on which way you lean, I'm curious what you think the next verse is going to be. I'll tell you what the next few verses are, and then I'll show you how this story is a challenge to both poles. The way the story goes is, God says, okay. God says, okay. Now, I left something very important out. Hezekiah realizes something is amiss. And he's got to figure out, do I send these people who've come all the way this way to break bread together in honor of the Lord, but they have missed some of the rules? Do I send them away? Or do I ask God to honor our less than stellar situation? So he prays. God hears the prayer and he allows The the Hebrew word here is actually the word for atone. Now, there's background here. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, when the temple is rededicated to the Lord, you remember the line, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. It's not a coincidence that this story is in many ways acting out what was said at that moment. Because what happens? Hezekiah prays. The people who are known by his name, both Israel and Judah, have gathered together. They're seeking his face. And they're asking God to respect the fact that they've turned from their wicked ways. And in return, God hears their prayer and he heals, atones for their situation. If you lean left, you hear this story, and some of the commentaries say this. Aha! God is not interested in particulars. He's interested in universals. Oh, you conservatives, all you ever do is focus on particulars. God doesn't care about such minutia. Quit doing that to people. God cares about your heart of love and your intention. That's the story. Get over it. That's not actually what the text says. Hezekiah thinks it's such an important problem that he falls on his face and asks God to overlook what he believed was going to be the outcome. He asks God to bend the rule. That's different than thinking God could care less about the rule. Do you see the difference? But there's a real challenge there. There's a real challenge if you lean far right and you think, the one thing I know about God is that once he makes a rule, there's no getting around it. This is a rule that God gets around because his people have come to seek his face. And God says, I am not going to let this moment of togetherness, this moment of hospitality, this moment of good intent get robbed because of a technicality. 
Jesus seems to speak to that point in the New Testament. Remember when it was, it was a man who's hurting and Jesus has a chance to heal him. But the leaders say, you can't heal him on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, I think you've got your rules backwards. The rule about the Sabbath and the rule that these people are made in my image and my life, my life is going to be laid down for them, not for the day. That's text number one. Text number two, to give us some background, 2 Samuel chapter 6 or 1 Chronicles 13. This is the story of Uzzah touching the ark. People who lean far right love this text for good reason. You're looking for a text about holiness and obedience, you find it. God says, I want this to be holy and you are not allowed to touch the ark unless you are of a certain tribe and it's at a certain time. And in fact, I want the people of the tribe to hold it on poles. And I, this is a holy thing. It's on the back of a cart. It begins to rock. Uzzah tries to stop the cart and he touches it and he is struck dead. And the response you might get when you hear that story is this. God cares about particulars. How dare you overlook all the small instructions of the Lord? Look how serious God takes that small instruction. Makes sense. But then you can apply every particular that matters to you to a story that probably did not have those particulars in mind. I imagine you've heard sermons from Uzzah touching the ark with the application being whatever issue was important in your church at that time. Read church history, and you'll find that has always been true. I read some early 2nd and 3rd century writers who were using the Arian controversy about whether, you know, Jesus' relationship to the Father, and said, well, that's really what's going on here. I think that reading overlooks a very important element to the chapter. There is far more wrong going on here than just us at touching the ark. David was not told to move that ark. He had the wrong people moving the ark. It wasn't supposed to be put on a cart. Everything about the situation is wrong, and yet only one person dies. Do you see how the story is meant to challenge our starting assumptions? Wherever we're standing, God is standing back and saying, there's far more going on here than meets the eye. A story that on one hand may look like a trump card against the far left, turns into a story that might mean, look how God used this to tell a gospel story that one person could die on behalf of the people to allow sinful David and the sinful Israelites to live to fight another day. These texts can be used to teach a bigger story than what we often use them for. Both of those are in the background. Both of those are saying God cares about everything, but his character matters first. Watch out for our presumption. God is gracious more than we imagine. He's also serious about his word. We should aim to please him and trust in his goodness. Now we come to our text in the two minutes I have left. First, a message to those who lean too far left. Those who love God's love so much that they see God as a Santa Claus who only wants us to be happy, only overlooking, never confronting, never demanding, never punishing. Forget that God is holy. God says, I am a consuming fire. The sons of Aaron have just been consecrated. This is a very, very, very important role. They offer strange fire. The role requires a higher level of expectation. It seems clear to me that God has not invited them to do this. It seems clear they've done it in the wrong way. It seems clear to me there's something when the mentioning about the strong drink makes me think that they were not taking this seriously at all. God strikes them dead. Luke 12, 48 says, to whom much is given, much is required. Holiness is against presumption. Just read through Deuteronomy sometime and you'll find over and over again the statement, do not presume 
upon the holiness of God. When Saul is confronted because he was supposed to kill the king and not take anything back, but the prophet hears the bleeding of sheep and Saul says, ah, I did something good for God. He's going to appreciate my little token. The answer back is, you dared to presume upon the holiness of God. John the Baptist says to the people coming out to be baptized, don't presume to say to yourself, we have Abraham as our father. God can raise up children out of these stones. And Paul says in Romans, do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? The goodness of God is supposed to lead you to repentance. Ananias and Sapphira is a New Testament story. Oh, the first seven verses is a challenge for those that don't think that obedience and discipleship is serious business. And then there's the rest of the chapter. There's a God who says, I've made my point. I've done something you never would have imagined. I've taken the life of those I just set apart but I'm still in charge and I'm still working with you and we're going to get through this. His other two sons are supposed to figure out what to do the rest of the day and I promise you, I've never been where they are. I was never a Levitical priest in the Old Testament, but I remember the day my brother died. And if you ask me to perform some sort of action and to get all the rules right, I bet you I couldn't even tell you what day it was. They're supposed to eat the food. The idea is that somehow the food has inherited all the sins of the people, and then the priests eat it. They consume it. But this whole thing was botched, and so was it a good sacrifice? Was it a bad sacrifice? If they eat it, are they incurring the guilt of their brothers? which are supposed to be the holy intermediaries, they didn't know what to do, so they burn it. And Moses is livid. And he comes to Aaron and he says, I can't believe it. You just lost two sons for disobeying God. How could your other boys do the same thing? What is wrong with you people? And Aaron has this interesting response. It's, it's hard to understand exactly what he's getting at, but I, I like this, this approach. That what Aaron says is, God wanted a burnt offering, he wanted a blood offering. Take a look at my two dead boys. He got it. Do you think that if we had eaten this food at the end of this day, it would have made everything peachy keen? You think God would have been pleased? with us feasting with joy, representing the people, and our hands are stained with blood. Don't you think, maybe another way of saying it, there's been enough death for one day. And all the text says is, Moses agreed. Moses agreed. It's a powerful message to us who, who lean too far right. Those who speak of duty and precise obedience so much that we can't help but see every flaw in every one. And we see God is constantly looking down his nose at those who don't seem to get everything right. And then we hear these stories in the New Testament of a God who gets laborers in his vineyard, including the lazy bums who wouldn't show up to work until the last hour, and they get paid first. And we read about a God who comes to Israel and says, let me tell you what it looks like when God shows up. He goes and helps the widows in Zarephath. We see a, a Lord who says, those who are not against us are for us. You see, I said before, God is a consuming fire, but that applies in both directions. God is a consuming fire. And our unholiness gets consumed in his holiness. And the same fire that destroys Nadab and Abihu 
refines the people of Israel and lets them live another day. No, they did not consume the sacrifice like they should have. But God consumed the people in his goodness and gave them hope. I remember the story of Jonah, and it just stands out to me. There's this nation that does not have the law of Moses. The fact that Jonah would go to a nation that doesn't have the law of Moses and tell them God expects you to repent tells you God's holiness extends beyond the borders of Israel. But the fact that they do repent and God says, never mind, I'm not going to destroy you. And there's only one person in the story who's upset with God. And it's his prophet who just wants to see God fry some people. And he doesn't understand the consuming fire of God ultimately wants to consume us in his goodness to give us hope and a future. It's hard for people who lean left to believe God's holy anger is not mean, it's just. And it's hard for people who lean right to believe God's overlooking faults, even big ones. It's not spinelessness. It takes a God who's completely secure and fully aware of the iniquity of sin to take it all into account. Sometimes we live by the line, get it right or pay the price. And then we live our lives and we find we rarely get it right. And the New Testament tells us that Jesus paid the price. And by his spirit, he's at work in us getting it right. He calls for us to get it right. But even in our failings, he makes us right. It's the story of the gospel told over and over again. And when we read stories like Leviticus 10, let us run away from the poles, fall on our faces, and say the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Worship me, Lord.